It's late September. The summer peak has come and gone, and aquatic vegetation is starting to die off. That all means it's time to hit the bass ponds for some crazy action on small waters, and we're going to talk about that on this episode of Fishful Thinker, the podcast. I'm Chad Lachance, and you're listening to Fishful Thinker, the podcast. All things fishful, all the time. Hey guys, Chad Lachance here. Thanks so much for tuning into this episode of Fishful Thinker, the podcast. Of course, brought to you by fine folks at Sportsman's Warehouse. Visit them at any one of 140 plus stores nationwide, including the newest one in Virginia. Or of course, at sportsmans.com. They're the only reason this podcast is able to exist. Guys, it is the end of September. I love this time of year. All kinds of options. We've talked about it on several recent podcasts. And in fact, I want to apologize because this podcast is late getting published because we've been traveling and filming like crazy, having some really good content uh, shot for next year on television. You'll start seeing that on the YouTube channel, uh, quarter one as well, and uh, on World Fishing Network and Altitude Sports both. So we're... Uh, we're busy this time of year, and I was not able to get back to the office on Friday to get this done, so I apologize we're doing it here on Monday. But I'll tell you what, everywhere I go driving around town, in my hometown, there are little bass ponds here and there, and I can't help but but drool every time I drive by them at this time of year because there's two time of years that I really love fishing in the ponds, and one is very early in the year, and one is towards the tail end of the summer season where we are right now. And when I say very early in the year, I mean like March before stuff is really even greened up here in Colorado. Uh, it can be very cold, but some of the biggest bass of the year are going to move up and start taking advantage of the of the first couple of warm days, so March and April. But that's that season has come and gone. Well, then through July and August, you maybe you get a whole bunch of, of vegetation builds up, and the water gets really hot, a little bit stagnant, maybe even some vegetation dying or algae blooms, all kinds of stuff that might slow the bass down a little bit, slow their metabolism down, uh, things like that. But then when we start getting the first of these cold days, and we've been down into the high 40s, low 50s consistently now in the evenings, uh, low 70s for some of our afternoon temps, and uh, and the pond waters are cooling off a little bit. I'm starting to see temps that are closer to 70 degrees instead of 85 degrees, which they were six weeks ago. That cooler temperature will make all the difference in the world as far as you know, getting these bass perked back up and a little bit of hyperphagia or the fall feeding binge starting to come into their mind. And it happens quicker on the ponds um, than it does reservoirs. And the reason is this, it's a lower volume of water to heat or cool. So the ponds warm quicker in the springtime and they cool faster in the summer uh, or in the, in the fall. So they're farther along seasonally than the reservoirs might be. So we haven't had enough cold snaps to maybe have a bait fish die off yet, but we've got short enough days that the aquatic vegetation will start to die. And that's a really key thing. It's all about the solar periods. So that's a really key thing for the bass and ponds around town because when that vegetation starts to die off, it's going to move those fish around a whole bunch. And a lot of the vegetation, a lot of the fish that are in the vegetation are going to come out and be more open water oriented. And that's a really key thing uh, that I like about fish and ponds at, at this time of year is we get a lot of the bass will release from the heavy stuff they've been in. Like they might be buried in a lodia grass or hydrilla grass or whatever's in the pond uh, in, the, in the late summer, just buried in it and thriving in the oxygen that's being put off by those nice lush grass beds. But as those beds start to die, then the, just the opposite thing starts to happen and they'll start using oxygen rather than producing oxygen and that will get the bass that are within those beds out of there where they get start searching for more uh, dissolved oxygen in the water. It will also run the bluegills and the other invertebrates that are in there out, or vertebrates, I should say, that are in there out, and maybe some of the invertebrates as well. So everybody gets opened, it gets more into open water. And the other thing that will happen with the bass is as the water starts to cool, they'll start seeking warmer times of the day to feed. So they'll be feeding at a time that maybe is easier. They might be feeding at 2 o'clock in the morning in the middle of summertime when it's really hot out. And But this time of year, they'll look for those warm periods to feed. So when the water cools at night, they may shut down, uh, whereas they feed better during the day. So those are the reasons I like this time of year. The other thing is people are back in school. There aren't as many people just out you know, lollygagging around all the ponds. A lot of the ponds I'm referencing are reclaimed gravel quarries, and they're part of city park systems. 
uh, around various urban areas. Could be around Fort Collins or Pueblo or Denver or Boulder. We've got a whole slew of different ponds in our area. Uh, depending on where you listen to this podcast from, I know there's a bunch of them in, in Utah as well. Uh, a few of them in, in uh, Wyoming, though not as many of them. And, of course, anywhere in Kansas or any, any place there. The big difference might be that the seasons are a little slower uh, at lower elevation than they are here, but the solar periods are not. And that's going to be a key thing because it's the solar periods more than the temperature that kills the vegetation off and starts the process of, of heading towards fall fishing. So Kansas may be a little bit later, or Nebraska might be a little bit later than here in Colorado as far as making that transition, but not a lot because, again, it's the solar periods that matter, and that doesn't change. So that's why I like this time of year to fish them. But the, the real thing is, and the meat of this, is how do I go about fishing them? And this is a time of year where I'm a hard bait guy a lot or a moving bait guy a lot. If, you're, if we're talking about other times of season, I'm going to start talking about rubber worms and tube jigs and jigging pigs and stuff like that a lot when we start dealing with bass ponds. But this time of year, talking about late September, early October, I'm going to be throwing a lot of moving baits. So the first one that comes to mind for me is a, uh, without question, is going to be a spinner bait. And I know that's old school, right? That's an old school bait. Everybody's got spinner baits. If you've ever been bass fishing, it seems like you hardly see guys throwing them anymore, comparatively anyway. But they are incredibly effective baits. And I think they're very, very effective in ponds in the fall of the year because I can cover a lot of water. In most cases, I can throw them a long ways. I can work them through various vegetation without them hanging up too much. So as far as the stringy vegetation goes uh, or around the edges of the dying vegetation uh, or whatever vegetation may still be green, uh, I can work it around those pretty well. I can work it high in the water column or lower in the water column. I can do a lift and drop or a straight retrieve. One of my favorite retrieves with a spinnerbait for bass is, is to have a, the, the main blade or the big blade be a willow blade and have that thing break the surface film ever maybe three feet of my retrieve so it's running just under the surface making a v wake and every so often that blade will break the surface and flick the water very very similarly to shad or bait fish popping in the pond that is probably the easiest thing it's typically the first thing i'm going to start throwing when i walk up to a pond and it won't matter a whole bunch right now whether the wind's blowing or not blowing or the water clarity or any of that so much as it might the rest of the year if the water's real clear i'll just use a natural color maybe a slightly smaller bait, but it's still going to be a bait I'm going to gravitate to because the fish are tuned in to feeding up in the water column. For one, it's an active bait and the water's cooled, so the fish have a pretty good metabolism going and can get some action, but it's not so cold that you need a slow presentation. It's kind of that in between. And it's just an excellent way to get a lot of bites. And I can throw different angles. I can throw it right down the bank or across open water. I can, again, work it right through the surface film or all the way down at the, at the top of the weeds or anywhere in between. So that's one of the first baits I'm gonna gravitate to. And in a pond scenario, a lot of the time it's gonna be something in the panfish color because you don't tend to see as many open water bait fish as like shad or, or smelt or things like that in a lot of the ponds around town. Some of them do have gizzard chat in them, but for the most part, the ponds that I'm talking about are, are sunfish, you know, bluegills, crappies, uh, pumpkin seeds, green sunfish. Those are going to be your primary uh, food sources in terms of the fish go. So my spinner baits are going to be in that color range as well. And I've been throwing that new Berkeley Power power bait spinner bait for a while now it's a fantastic spinner bait i know the guy designed the bait know him very well um was co-designed with edwin evers who's a spinner bait guy and they fixed everything that was wrong with a traditional spinner bait came out with a really high quality model and i've been putting that thing through its paces uh it's working very well so that's one of the first baits that i will gravitate to along those lines and i don't do it as much because maybe i'm old school and maybe i just not as much of an early adopter to it, but a bladed jig like a slobber knocker, chatterbait style style bait is also a good choice for the same reasons that the spinnerbait is. It's a little slower than a spinnerbait. The bait can't be retrieved quite as fast and it puts off a little bit more thump to it. Uh, not quite as tunable, let's just say, as a spinnerbait where I can use a smaller blade and change everything up very easily. Uh, the, the chatterbait style bait or the bladed jig is not as versatile. So I don't throw it as much, but I know a lot of guys that do. And it's another very, very good choice this time of year for basically the same reasons that the spinnerbait is. So one of those two would be a really, really good choice for you to consider um, a lot at the time for this time of year. Another good possibility is a wake bait of some sort. 
uh, wake bait meaning like a crankbait that runs right into the surface and makes a wake. No matter how much you deal with it as far as diving or not, you know, as far as retrieving it, no matter how fast or slow you retrieve it, it stays on the surface and wobbles back and forth, creates a very classic V wake um, and can be an excellent way to get uh, summer, late summer, early fall bass to bite. Again, working it over the top for the same reasons as a spinnerbait, over the top of the vegetation, down any kind of edge you can find. Also works excellent along riprap banks, which are fantastic in the fall of the year. Um, the riprap banks can hold a ton of fish, especially as the water starts getting colder and colder because they will hold sun and bass will gravitate to them because the sun will warm the riprap, which will get the whole food chain going. And as we've already mentioned, the vegetation is dying off. Uh, a lot of times there's an edge, there's a hard edge of the vegetation right at the bottom of the riprap. So wherever the riprap ends at the bottom of whatever bank it's on, there'll be a weed edge that starts right there, giving you open water, kind of a wedge to fish between the edge of the weeds and the rocks. And a, and a wake bait runs fantastic right through that. It's a bait that I would gravitate to in a hurry for sure. Again, a bunch of companies make them. The one I throw the most is called the wake bowl, but you can pick the one you like. Again, it's going to typically be in some sort of panfish colors, uh, a bluegill type color, crappie type color, something like that. Oranges, blues, browns, uh, that kind of color color spectrum. So wake bait's another really good choice. Along those lines, another one that I really like, and we talk a lot on for this podcast, uh, is, the, is the hit stick. And the thing about the hit stick is it's basically a modernized version of the classic floating rapala. And floating rapala is a great bait, don't get me wrong, and I've talked about it a lot. But they're expensive, and they're fragile, and they're inconsistent. They don't all run the same. They're very fragile. If you hit that riprap I was talking about, with a balsa bait, it's going to damage the bait, period, and you're at very least going to have to repair it uh, if it's repairable at all. And if, there's, if the finish is cracked and it gets water in it, then the bait is junk, and that finish is pretty easy to crack because it's just painted on, as opposed to the hit stick, which... The action was computer modeled after the original action of the floating rapala, but they've done much better with the balance of the bait and being able to cast it. And it's made out of molded plastic, so it's much more durable and consistent. All of them are exactly the same. So that's a really good reason uh, to choose it over traditional balsa floating minnow bait. But regardless of whichever of those you choose, Working it in a twitch it where you just barely pop it under the surface and let it pop back up and pull it along a couple of feet and let it pop back up and pull along a couple more feet and pop back to the surface and break the surface film. Fantastic way to get pond bass uh, to go this time of year. I mean, fantastic way. And in, and if you're a fan of this podcast, you know, or any of our content, you know I do jerk baits a lot. I fish jerk baits a ton for a lot of species of fish. I will work one uh, directly under this, work that hit stick tip up instead of tip down. Because keep in mind, if I'm in the pond fishing, I'm 99% chance I'm going to be on the bank. And I want to keep the bait high in the water column. So I'm going to work it tip up and I'm going to work it crisply and aggressively like I would a jerk bait, but tip up instead of tip down just to keep the bait higher in the water. Uh, fantastic. Again, a really, really great way to get largemouth to bite as the water cools off a little bit and the vegetation starts to die back. So <clears throat> that's one that I really like. Uh, again, a bunch of colors. The one thing to stay away from, and, the, and this is the thing I, I deal with a lot with people that, that they don't have the confidence to throw the big one. I would do better in a bass pond scenario throwing a number 13 in the type of scenarios we're talking about, throwing a number 13, which is 13 centimeters long. That's a big bait by a lot of people's standards, not maybe a hardcore tournament guy's standards, but for sure, um, Joe Average Weekend guy may not want to throw a 13 centimeter bait, but I'm telling you, it's an excellent way to get bites this time of year, and even little guys will jump all over that thing. So if, you're really, if it really bugs you to throw in that big, throw a number 11. There's no scenario that I'm going to throw anything any smaller than that for bass. Keep in mind, largemouth are named for the size of their mouth, not the size of their brain. And I want the biggest ones. And all other things being equal, they will eat a third of their body length as long as it's long and skinny. So if I want to catch an 18-inch bass, I need a 6-inch bait. And that's pretty standard stuff. So 13 centimeters is uh, just a little over 6 inches, I guess. But uh, but still, it's pretty pretty close. So... That'd be a bait I would look at, would be the hit stick for sure. Uh, uh, another bait that I might throw even more on the surface oriented than that would be a buzz bait or a chopo, both of which are going to be extremely noisy 
extremely um, aggressive style of bait. So if I really want to swing for the bleachers, I will throw uh, one of those two. It's a great way to get a really big bite for one, and, and it's pure fun because it's on the surface. Everybody loves a topwater bite, and they're quick. You can work either one of those baits as quickly, just about as quickly as you want. When do I choose the Chapo or, or the, the uh, Whopper Plopper style bait, whatever you want to call it? When do I choose the Chapo versus the buzz bait, the traditional wireframe buzz bait? It, that 100% comes down to the cover in the pond. If the pond's a little bit deeper and doesn't have quite so much weed growth in it, I'd rather throw the Chapo. The hookup percentage is better, and I can pause the bait if I need to because it floats. It's got two treble hooks, so it's not going to be as good around vegetation is the problem. So if I need a certain level of weedlessness, then I'm going to go ahead and throw the traditional buzz bait, and that will definitely be more weedless than the chapo, but a little bit less versatile. Either one of those two baits will generate explosive strikes from largemouth, particularly as the water cools back into the into the you know low 70s, high 60s range. That's a great way to get them. So that's one that I'll use a bunch. And then another one that I'll throw um, maybe a little bit deeper is something like the classic hollow belly, like a six inch long soft swim bait. In this scenario, I'm not talking about something like um, like on a jig head, like is so popular these days with the little swim bait, you know, small swim baits on a jig head. So, so popular. I get it. But for what we're talking about here, I want to be able to swim it closer to the vegetation. I also want to be able to kill it and let it settle back down to the weed growth on the bottom, uh, particularly if some of that weed growth is still alive. So I want to retrieve it, retrieve it, retrieve it, and then kill it on tight line. Just kill the act, kill every reel and just let it drift down and it will slowly drift its way to the bottom and swim its way to the bottom very slowly. can be an excellent way to get big ones to bite. And I, I will throw that in a bare minimum of a five inch uh, and maybe a six inch. And in most cases, I'm going to throw that either unweighted on a Big old EWG Texas rig, uh, and if you're not familiar with the Texas rig, look up uh, my YouTube channel at Fishful Tanker. We demonstrate how to rig all kinds of different baits, Texas style there, uh, to keep them weedless. So I will rig it either weightless with the, with an EWG hook. Uh, it's going to be either four or five out hook, depending on how big of the of the uh, soft swim bait I'm throwing. And I might rig it on a keel-weighted hook, which has got the weight molded onto the shank of the hook as opposed to the front of the hook like a jig would be. Uh, one of those two, and that'll come down to how deep the water is, how much wind I'm dealing with, and, and how fast I want to retrieve the bait. If I want to retrieve it faster, I'll put more weight on it. If I want to retrieve it slower, I'll put less weight on it. But I'm typically going to throw a hollow belly, the old school hollow belly bait. Um, again, that's another power bait product, but I've had so much success with them over the years that you just can't. It's hard to beat, very hard to beat. And a, and a six inch hollow belly rigged sideways on an EWG hook is a really good way to get pond bass to bite. And it's a really good on baits on ponds that get a lot of pressure because they don't see that bait very much. They might see buzz baits. They sure are going to see some spinner baits or chatter baits and some sort of crank baits. Guys are going to run those around some, but you're not going to see a lot of guys that are going to run a big soft swim bait of some sort, you know, like I said, in the six or seven inch range. Uh, we filmed that bite a few different times on some smaller lakes around Colorado, and it, I mean, you, they are big, ferocious strikes. It is a really fun way to, uh, to, catch, to catch bass. And so, that's a, a really good possibility as well. And then the last one I'm going to throw out there uh, is a lipless crankbait. And a lipless crankbait, we talk about that, again, a lot in all kinds of fishful thinker stuff. It's the versatility of it that I love, love, love. Uh, in the case of fall, it's going to be high in the water calm. If it contacts vegetation, I'm going to rip it aggressively out of that vegetation and let it flutter. I might be doing a, a really fast lift and drop. I might be doing a high-speed burn. But either way, I'm going to work that bait aggressively. And I'm only going to choose that bait when it's either extremely glass calm and I'm trying to get uh, a reaction out of the fish. In other words, the fish are not feeding well and I'm trying to get them to pounce. In that case, either that hit stick worked like a jerk bait or the lipless crankbait in full speed or the chopo in a full speed wind are excellent ways to get uh, to get the bites bass to bite. Conversely, I'll throw the lipless crankbait when it's really windy. That or the spinnerbait are one of the only two I'm going to go for. 
and the with the amount of vibration and noise that a lipless crankbait comes out uh, or puts out, it's a really good way to help fish locate it when the wind is ripping. So if you're out in the fall and you're getting some of that fall wind going, a lipless crankbait be your friend. Similar along the same lines as how do I choose a chopo versus a buzz bait? I will choose the spinner bait if I need a little bit more weedlessness and the lipless crankbait if I don't for the same exact reasons. The single big hook on the spinner bait versus the two treble hooks on the lipless crankbait. Both put off a lot of vibration. Both put off a lot of flash and noise. Um, one of them can be thrown a little bit farther and worked a little faster, but otherwise they do the same kinds of things for the bass. So those are what I'm looking at there. Now, another thing I'll throw out about all these baits I have said today, a... Seven foot medium heavy casting rod is perfect for all of them. If you don't like throwing casting rods, fine. Throw a medium heavy spinning rod. But either way, everything I just mentioned can be thrown on the same rod and reel. And that's important because we're pond fishing. We don't have our boat. We don't have five rods with us. We might, might have two. I typically will bring two. Half the reason is so I can have two opposite baits. And the other half of the reason is because if I tangle or break something, I don't want to have to give up. So I'll bring two rods. So if I grenade a reel or something evil happens and I break the tip off a rod, well, that's not a problem. I can keep fishing. So I will pretty much always have two rods. But, but the bait selection I gave you today, Day, you can throw on medium heavy rod for all of it across the board. Also, all of them would benefit from relatively mid-level speed wise on a reel. So something like a, if you're throwing a casting reel, something like a 6.4 to 1 type deal. For me, everything's Revo's, Revo SX would be a, a very classic pond reel for me. It'd be a 6.4 to 1. I would have a 7 foot uh, Abu Garcia, probably a Veritas PLX rod and medium heavy power, fast action. And without question, it would have 30 pound braid on it. Uh, in that scenario, it's probably going to be either uh, spider wire Duratuff or, or Dur braid, I should say, or it's going to be X5, Berkeley X5 braid. The, the, um, the Dura braid is very, very abrasive, and it's got big filaments that make up the braid itself. So it's very good for durability, um, but it, it's a little rougher on my fingers than I like. So unless I really need that extra durability, then I will go back. Uh, I would rather go to the X5 braid, which is somewhere between my most favorite braid, which is X9, which is very smooth, um, but maybe not quite as abrasive resistant, uh, whereas the Dura braid, the, the spider rest Dura braid, is very rough, but has excellent abrasion resistance. The X5 is somewhere in between the two. So that's what I would choose for equipment. Um, not really complicated there. One small bag of stuff, a pair of pliers, and without question, my Costa's got to have them every time. Uh, and without, uh, I mean, there's no chance that I'm fishing without my glasses on. And I consider them one of my most important features. And when I'm talking about pond fishing especially, it's true because I'm looking even more so for the color of the vegetation, for the edges of the vegetation, for the individual rocks within them, anything that will give me an advantage because I don't have sonar. So the only way I have to read the water in front of me is with my glasses, or, and that's that's important. So for me, it's a Costa and a green mirror. By the way, big shout out to Costa. This is their 40th uh, year in business. Pretty impressive. I've been with Costa since 2006. And I've been wearing them since the early 90s. So, uh, and the company was founded in 86. So let's just say I was an early adopter, or uh, excuse me, 83. Let's just say I was an early adopter to the Costa glasses, and uh, and I've been wearing them ever since for good reason. So by the way, check out King Tide. That's their newest 40th anniversary edition. It has all of the technology they've figured out in the last 40 years. Put them in one sunglass frame. Yes, I don't have a pair. Yes, I have worn them, though, and uh, and they're on their way, hopefully, to my house because I have them on order. So um, all the stuff I mentioned, by the way, you can get at Sportsman's Warehouse, which we talk about a lot, and I, I recommend you check that out. If you guys want to join the conversation on, on our other social media, I would appreciate that, or you can send me questions or whatever. That That's at Fishful Thinker on Facebook, Instagram, or TikTok. And, of course, the YouTube channel, lots and lots of how-to stuff up there, shorts, cooking stuff, full shows, the whole nine yards. So check all that stuff out as well. So thanks for listening. This has been Fishful Thinker, the podcast. Mm-hmm.